Welcome and thank you for joining us for worship today. Uh, just a note about worship for 731, um, July 31st, which is a fifth Sunday. And here at Tulare, we'll be doing a hymn sing. So there won't be any sermon per se. Um, what I may do, though, is uh, share an, uh, another sermon, an oldie but goodie for you, uh, and invite you to worship that way with us online. Now, let us open with prayer. God of grace and God of glory, come and be known to us in our gathering together. Come and be present in the songs we sing and in the prayers we raise. From the busy byways of life, we come to find once again that you are always present and always ready to receive us. As we affirm our faith this day, deepen the roots of our commitment that we may learn your calling upon our lives. Surround us now with the love and comfort of your Holy Spirit and the direction and redemption of Christ. Amen. Now let's join together in song. Our God. Open the eyes of the blind, there's no one like you, none like you. Into the darkness you shine, out of the ashes we rise, there's no one like you, there's none like you. is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise, there's no one like you, there's none like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God. Our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. stop us and if our God is with us then what could stand against and if our God is for us then who could ever stop us and if our God is with us then what could stand against what could stand against Our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. 
And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And what could stand against? join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength, and our Redeemer. Amen. So far, in this new authoritative teaching that Jesus offers his disciples, he has shown us what the people of the kingdom of heaven look like in the Beatitudes, how they are blessed and how they bless bless others. He's also shown how kingdom people move beyond the words of the law to the intent behind them. And in the process, they demonstrate a righteousness that surpasses even that of the Pharisees. Well, today, we're going to hear Jesus talk about one of the core means of grace for a disciple, that is, prayer, and how we live prayer out in our lives. Jesus will also offer us a model prayer to shape our prayer life. Both Matthew and Luke contain the Lord's Prayer. In Luke, the prayer comes at the request of the disciples. They say, Lord, teach us to pray like John taught his disciples. But in Matthew, Jesus is the instigator. Jesus wants us to see how this prayer and our prayer life are expressions of the kingdom of heaven. And that's what we'll talk about today. There are other sermons where we can learn about the shape of the prayer and how to let that shape shape our prayers or, or to take each part and dissect it for its meaning for us today. But you know, I don't think I've heard a sermon about how the Lord's Prayer fits into the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. Why, why does Jesus teach it now? And what does it have to do with kingdom life? Now, Jesus doesn't begin with the Lord's Prayer in today's passage. Rather, he gives us a warning about how we pray. Matthew chapter 6, 5 through 8. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So I reread this, these verses in light of the recent Supreme Court decision about that coach who prayed on the 50-yard line. You know, I thought, Ouch. Now, I know that coach thinks his public prayer is a witness to his faith. Well, so probably did the ones Jesus is talking about in these verses, the ones who stand where that they may be seen by others. They have gotten their reward, Jesus says, because in the end it's really about them, not God or the kingdom. John Wesley reminds us that whenever we pray, our single purpose should be to commune with God. Now, Jesus is not saying never pray in public. He prayed in public and he participated in prayers in the synagogues. And the prayer that he gives us after this is a corporate prayer. These words we just heard are are about staying in love with God. In our time of prayer, we are building and nurturing our relationship with our Father in heaven. There's something that is intimate 
about that. And it deserves our undivided attention, which is not to say this is always me and Jesus. Our Stephen ministers have this rich prayer circle that is not about showing off their piety, but about nurturing the relationship with God that grounds us and their relationships with each other. You'll remember that Jesus calls us salt and light earlier. And I hope that you remember how we talked about salt is there to bring out the best flavor in others. And the light we shine is the reflection of God's light in our lives. I, I don't know if either of those is true for the coach in Washington. One reason I can say that is because I know someone who lived salt and light out in her ministry as a public school teacher. Students came to know her as someone they could trust, who would listen to them, ask good questions, and, and help them find answers without dictating to them. They sought her out, and they often discovered her with her Bible in prayer. She would be sitting alone in her classroom, reading, studying, and praying. And as they left, if they looked back, they would see her bow her head in prayer, likely for them. Some of them began asking her about it and why she read and prayed. She quietly shared her faith with them. And when they started jo joining her for prayer, she showed them how. I met some of her former students decades after they left her classroom. You see, they still sought her out. And she still prayed for them and with them. She truly was salt and light in their lives. Then, after cautioning us about how not to pray... Jesus then shows us how to pray. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 14. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Notice that this is a corporate prayer. And by that I mean it is about the body rather than just one person. All the first person references in this prayer are plural. Our, us, we. When we pray this prayer, we're praying for all kingdom people, not just ourselves. There are three main parts to this prayer. First, we, we talk about who we're addressing, God, our Father. And then there are these petitions that focus on God. And then third, there are petitions that focus on our life as kingdom people in the world. When I, started my, uh, when I start my pastoral prayer, I intentionally choose how to address God. Sometimes it's gracious Lord, or it might be Almighty God, or our Heavenly Father. How we start our prayer is important. Important. It, it introduces and shapes what we pray and how we pray. Jesus invites us to name God as Father. Amy Jill Levine reflects on the implications for us when we call God our Father. She says, we are all related. We are, all, we are family. We are to be faithful to one another as God the Father is faithful to us. These opening words then bind us together in the family of God. Next, Jesus call, tells us to call on God to complete the kingdom on earth so that God's will is done here as it is in heaven. Now, we miss the urgency in this petition to God. In English, as one commentator noted, it sounds like a praise, hallowed be thy name. But it is more than that in Greek. It is an imperative. We are calling on God to act, just like the psalmist would call on God to do something. And specifically, we are calling on God to reveal the glory of God in this ugly, evil wor world and to do it soon. Jesus follows the petition with a petition that God's will be done on earth, that God's kingdom come in all its glory here. 
For John Wesley, that means we will do God's will continually and perfectly, just as the angels in heaven do. But under this petition is this acknowledgement that we need God's help to accomplish this. While we strive to use the power God gives us to resist evil and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves, we can't succeed in overcoming them. That is up to God, and we pray for it to happen soon. Until then, though, there are some basic needs we have that God can help with. And the first is nourishment. One of the gifts of the study we did on the Sermon on the Mount was to point out the redundancy in the petition to give us this day our daily bread. As Amy Jill Levine points out, it's a bit like saying hot water heater. I mean, what does a water heater do but make water hot? Why do you need to say hot water heater, right? So in the same way, why not just say, give us our daily bread or give us this day our bread? Don't those make the same point? Why do we say, give us this day our daily bread? And as Amy Jill Levine teased out the Greek word used in this passage, she offers something I found extremely powerful. She suggests that Jesus is telling his disciples to ask, give us tomorrow's bread today. What does that mean? Well, we say it each time we gather around the communion table. We proclaim that the bread we eat there is a foretaste of the kingdom, that one day we will feast with Jesus at the heavenly banquet. Yes, we are asking that God nourish our bodies as he did in the wilderness when the Israelites ate the manna that they gathered every day. But we are also asking that we receive a taste of that bread that we will share in the kingdom. It points beyond this life to that time when God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. What does that look like? I have this favorite picture of heaven and hell, which I might have shared with some of you before. A man dies and he goes to heaven and meets St. Peter at the pearly gates. And Peter's looking at his, his file and he says, well, you know, you're close to the edge. You could go either way. So, you know what? I'm going to let you choose. Would you rather go to heaven or hell? Well, it might seem natural to say heaven. The man says, can I have a look before I decide? Well, sure, Peter says. So he takes him down to hell. And they open the door, and oh my, on the tables in front of them are heaped the best, most wonderful foods that you can imagine. The smell that hits you is just divine. And all around are these awful, miserable, skinny people. And they aren't eating any of the food. Uh, they can't because around their necks are tied these long spoons, like three feet long. And, and if they try to go down, the spoon hits the table and they can't reach the food. And it's too long and their hands are tied behind them so they can't move the spoon to their mouths. And so they're sitting in, all, in front of all of this awesome food, unable to eat a bite, starving to death. Oh my, the man says. That doesn't look good. Can I check out heaven? Okay, says Peter, come on. And so he goes up and he opens these great doors and oh, the smell that hits you when it come, they come open. The tables are just heaped with wonderful foods and it's so divine. And all the people sitting around the table are happy and plump and full. But they also have these three foot spoons tied around their neck and their, their hands are tied behind their back. It looks a lot like hell in that respect. The difference is in heaven, the people take those spoons and feed their neighbors, who in turn feed them. So we're asking not only to sustain and nurture our bodies, but help us sustain and nurture one another. And in this passage that we read today, those verses that we just said from 9 to 14, twice, twice does Jesus talk about forgiveness and the importance of forgiving one another. It's part of the prayer, and then he emphasizes it again afterwards. You know, how often 
Do we focus on God's forgiveness of our sins that God showers upon us? while forgetting the importance Jesus places on living out that forgiveness in our lives, we have received grace, and we also show grace. This is really important to Jesus. Earlier in the sermon, when he talked about anger, he tells us that if we have anything against a brother or sister, we should leave our gift at the altar and go and be reconciled before offering to God. Later, he will tell a parable about a man who is forgiven a huge debt but cannot forgive a small one owed him and the consequences of his unforgiveness. And again here, he says it not just once in a few verses, but twice. It all comes back to peacemaking, doesn't it? Not just making peace between these two other parties, but living peace out in our lives through forgiveness. Finally, we ask God not to lead us into temptation and to deliver us from evil. Have you ever watched the show, What Would You Do? Using hidden cameras, host John Quinones observes and comments on how ordinary people behave when they are confronted with dilemmas that require them either to take action or to walk by and mind their own business. Things like a boy is bullied by others in public, or a woman's Uber driver doesn't match the profile she has, or, or someone ridicules another person for some physical characteristic. The temptation being offered there is, will you help or will you walk away? It's a test of your character. We don't like to think that God tests us, but there are some biblical passages I can show you where God ju does just that. Why do we test people or things? To make sure they have the strength or ability to deal with both the ordinary and the extraordinary. You know, we have ex extensive tests that ministerial candidates undergo. Theological tests, uh, ex ex practical ministry tests, and psychological tests. It was one such psychological test that a man named Jim Jones failed when he sought to be a Methodist minister. And he later showed in Guyana why that test revealed problems. So what is Jesus saying we should ask God? I like Amy Jill Levine's summary. Let us not be tempted to use our resources just for ourselves. Let us not come to a place where we lord it over others rather than engage in servant leadership. Let us not desire the splendors of the world rather than attend to its needs. If such temptations come, and they will, we know we have the resources to resist and to overcome. Those are the same resources that will deliver us from evil. For some people, the recitation of the Lord's Prayer in worship is tedious and uninspiring. One of the things that many contemporary worship services did in the 90s was jettison traditional corporate readings, including creeds and the Lord's Prayer. I remember one grandmother lamenting that her grandchildren, who regularly attended a church, could not say the Lord's Prayer and had in fact never heard it before they went to church with her. And yet, and yet every pastor will tell you about the member who has advanced Alzheimer's and yet would sit up and join in saying the Lord's Prayer. Or the power of a group of Christians from all parts of the world praying the Lord's Prayer together, each in his or her own language. This prayer connects us to each other in powerful ways. The Reverend Becca Stevens reflects on the Lord's Prayer and her faith life. She writes, Sometimes I say that prayer and think about the act of praying and what it means to be faithful. I think about how my mom and dad said the same prayer and how I said that prayer recently to a friend who was passing. And, and then every so often I say that prayer that I have recited a hundred thousand times and something new speaks to me. All of a sudden, I'm filled again with new gratitude for this prayer that held words that were not dressed up for others, but instead were words that stripped me down to my core and allowed me to grow in my faith. Prayer shapes us. 
And this prayer in particular strips us to our core and shapes us into kingdom living people. Amen. Let us pray. Most loving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we come to you today offering ourselves. Lord, we want to be kingdom people. And Jesus, we tr thank you for showing us what that means through your Sermon on the Mount. It's very difficult, Lord, to, to live the life of a disciple that he describes there, to be peacemakers, to um, be meek, to be salt and light, to trust in you for our bread, for the ability to forgive others. Lord, we, we need your help. And so we ask today, through your spirit, work in us and through us that we might be more faithful, that we might love you more and love those whom you call your children as you love them. Keep us close to you. Help us to stay connected. And when we pray together, as we will in a few moments, answer our prayer. Come and hallow your name here on earth as it is in heaven. And may your will be done here as well. And now, Lord, we lift up to you these prayers that are in our hearts. Lord, hear these prayers and, and hear us as we pray together, saying as Jesus taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us bless our gifts to God. Heavenly Father, as a parent, you have given us all that we need. And as followers of your Son, as kingdom people, we do likewise. We give from our hearts as you gave from yours. Bless these gifts. And may they be seeds for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And where will we go and who will we be? We go out into the world. Be God's people. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.